Okay, we've gone over uh, the two minutes past the hour, and that is my cue to get us started. So um, welcome, everyone. My name is Steve Kenzie. I'm the Executive Director of the UN Global Compact Network UK. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the third session of our six-part Transitioning to a Circular Economy webinar series. Today, will we... Today, we will be discussing the circular economy in the context of electronics value chains. Before we get started, though, a bit of housekeeping. Um, before anyone asks, I, I think before anyone's asked yet, um, the session is being recorded, and we will be making the recording available to you after the session ends, um, probably a couple of days after, but we'll be as quick as we can with that. Please also note that we are in webinar mode. And so that means um, attendees will not be able to unmute, but we still are really keen to hear from you. And uh, two ways for that. Firstly, through the Q&A box. At the bottom of your screen, there is a, a button labeled Q&A. If you have questions that you would like us to present to our panelists, that's the place to put it. So um, if you put your questions in the other uh, communications channel that we're going to have open, um, it won't be presented to the to the panelists. So questions in the Q&A box, and then you will see there an opportunity to vote for the questions that you'd like us to answer. Um, the way the previous sessions in this series have gone is we've had more questions than we've had time for. So it's really important that you help us out and click on the thumbs up and vote up the questions that you would like us to prioritize and that will help to ensure that we're um, talking about the issues that are most important to you. If you would like to comment, as clearly many of you are happy to do, um, that's for the chat box. So um, as I said at the outset, do feel free to say hi, share your LinkedIn profile. Um, if as we're going along you want to comment and not necessarily ask a question, that's the place to do it. Um, and we certainly welcome your active engagement in the chat. We have activated automatic captions, which you can choose to accept in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. These captions are generated automatically by Zoom, so please forgive any typos or mistakes, not our fault. And lastly, um, if you would like to post on social media about the session, we certainly encourage that. Please um, be sure to use the tag um, tag us in that, um, Global Compact Network UK, and please use the hashtag, hashtag T2CE 2023. Um, we'll put those uh, details into the chat for you, and maybe we'll also repost them just a few times so that they uh, are readily available. But um, yeah, most appreciated if you could help amplify uh, what we're doing here today. Okay, let's go on to the next slide, a, a bit somber, um, but important. Obviously, not so prominent in the news anymore, but millions of people are still suffering as a result of the earthquakes that hit Turkey and Syria last month, and they urgently need life-saving assistance. The UNHCR, the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, has stepped up its operations across the region. Please do, please do what you can to support them. We've put um, a link in the chat um, where you can find more information about how you can do that. Um, thank you very much in advance for, for supporting those um, poor people. Okay, let's move on to our next slide, please. Um, just a bit about who we are. This webinar, as I said, is being brought to you by the UN Global Compact Network UK. We are part of the UN Global Compact, which is the world's largest corporate sustainability initiative with more than 20,000 participating companies globally. Our initiative is built on a foundation of 10 universal principles for responsible business that have been drawn from UN treaties in the areas of human rights, labor, environment, and anti-corruption. To join our initiative requires a commitment from your CEO to operationalize our principles throughout your organization, to report annually on the progress towards this end, and to support the wider UN agenda. Our role is to support UK-based participants to fulfill these commitments, and we do so by organizing over 100 uh, events every year 
to inspire and enable corporate sustainability. If your company is not already participating in the UN Global Compact, please do get in touch. And I know we have a very international um, audience today. There are Global Compact networks in 76 countries around the world, um, hopefully in yours, and we'd be very happy to help connect you to them um, if you're interested in more information about the Global Compact. And again, um, some links have gone into the chat uh, with more information. Okay. I spoke about the commitment to the Global Compact and including a commitment to the wider UN agenda. And of course, that's something that we take very seriously. A big part of our mission is to drive business engagement with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, also known as the SDGs. The goals provide a comprehensive and coherent roadmap to create the future we want, and business has a big role to play in achieving these goals. I encourage you to think about how your work impacts the SDGs, and to that end, I would like to just flag that today's session is particularly linked to Goal 12, which calls on us to ensure sustainable consumption and production patterns. Of course, though, the goals are quite interlinked, and several more are highly relevant to today's conversation. Okay, next slide. In today's session, we're gonna be focusing on circularity for electronics. Electronics play an enormous role in modern society and the market for electronic goods is projected to keep growing in the future. However, the way in which electronics are currently produced and consumed presents tremendous risks with regards to resource use, greenhouse gas emissions, and e-waste pollution. According to the UN's Global E-Waste Monitor 2020 report, 53.6 million metric tons of electronic waste was generated globally in 2020 alone. The same report predicts that global e-waste, defined as products with a battery or a plug, will reach 74 million metric tons by 2030 making it the fastest growing waste stream. It is also estimated that $57 million worth of high value recoverable materials, such as gold, silver, copper, and platinum were mostly dumped or burned. As we discussed in our previous session in this series, the mining for minerals that are included in electronics and the e-waste that is currently being created has enormous environmental and social impacts that are causing disproportionate harm in developing countries. So in today's session, we're gonna be focusing in on the importance of adopting the principles of a circular economy in the electronics value chain to overcome the challenges related to e-waste and the mining of virgin materials. To help us, we are joined by a fantastic panel of speakers. Thea Kleinmagd, Circular Materials Chain Circular Material Chains Innovator from Fairphone is with us. Then we'll hear from Stuart Hayward Hyam, Chief Technical Development and Innovation Officer at Suez UK. And then we have Camille Richard, Head of Sustainability at Backmarket. And finally, Carmen Enne, CEO of Three Step IT. I am delighted that we have such a strong panel. Um, Please uh, feel free to start firing off your questions um, at any point. Let me remind you again, though, that the session is going to be recorded and we will share the recording. Questions in the Q&A, comments in the chat. And without any further ado, I'm delighted to hand over to Thea. Thank you very much, Steve. And welcome, everyone. Thank you for having me. So I'm going to talk you through Fairphone's approach on a circular smartphone, the Fairphone, and also the pair material choices that we do for this phone. So on the next slide, you can see our mission. So Fairphone is a company which is not just interested in selling phones, but we would like to have an impact on the whole smartphone industry and showing that there is a market for ethical electronics and thereby also motivating other companies to improve in these respects. Uh, Fairphone has four different impact areas that you can see on the next slide. 
uh, and three of these impact areas are also interesting for circularity and what we're going to talk uh, about today. So these are the fair materials as the materials that go into our phone, longevity, the how long do our products last and are used, and also take back in the sense of that we want to get our phones back to be able to reuse them because you cannot call a product circular if there is no way to recirculate it or its components or its materials. Then first of all, on the next slide, we would uh, or I would want to show you why it is important to look at smartphones, because smartphones are a relatively small product, and you might think that its impact is, added, is, is, is quite small. But what we can see here is that the emissions that are projected um, for the ICT industry in the coming years, so up to 2040, um, are projected to increase from 4% to 14%. And of all the ICT-related emissions, smartphones already now have a percent, have 11% of a share in those emissions. So it is quite noticeable what we cause or our industry causes in emissions. And uh, where does that come from? So on the next slide, there are basically three points that are very crucial in where this impact comes from. So if we sell every year 1.4 billion of smartphones and we only use them for two to three years, and we also don't really recycle them or only a very small percentage of it, then of course we are looking here at a big problem. So then on the next slide, you can see what we need to do to improve this for a smartphone. Um, so we conducted an LCA at Fairphone, and we are also very transparent on our assumptions that are behind this. So everyone can also look this up on our homepage in our LCA report. Um, and we came to the conclusion in every LCA that we did that the largest impact also for other environmental impacts lays in the production phase of the phone. And that basically means that if you want to decrease the environmental impact of a smartphone, you need to produce less smartphones first because if you for example use in 10 years usually with two to three years of a lifetime around four smartphones but you would be able to use a smartphone actually for five years then you have more or less just half of the impact and this is where we need to get to we really need to use less um yeah then what are the problems why smartphones don't last that long so we can see that on the next slide which is a bit of a quick overview on why smartphones are usually just used for two to three years. And that's often because the components that are used are already standardized and they don't necessarily last longer. Then the battery is more a matter of maintenance. A battery is decreasing in its capacity. So there is no way around this fact. And so it needs to be replaced in a certain moment. Um, yeah, it is hard to repair, for example, a screen when it breaks. And the screen breaks very often on a phone. You might see that on your own phone also. And then next to this also, of course, software support, user behavior, because we might want to have a new phone, which is also often triggered by brands that want to sell more phones, of course. And the first three of these points mentioned, they are easily solvable if a phone is modular and can be repaired very easily. And this is why the Fairphone is designed to be a modular phone, which we can see on the next slide. So the Fairphone has eight different modules and you can see here that um, just with a few screws, you can unscrew different parts of the phone. You can order a spare part on our homepage and you can just repair it on your own for a very small price compared to if you would also hand, need to hand it in, in to a repair center and you are never without the phone. Um, then also looking at the point of user behavior, um, on the next slide, you can see that we are just piloting in the Netherlands uh, Fairphone as a service model, which is called Fairphone Easy, which means that uh, the user doesn't buy the phone, but pays for the usage of the phone. And that means when the user doesn't want to use a phone anymore, 
we can repair it, we can refurbish it, and we can bring it back to the market to the next user who is going to use it. And by that, we are in control of the materials and can really make this not just a circular foam, but really a circular business model, which is also made to circulate um, for as long as it can, until it cannot be repaired anymore, it needs to go to recycling. Um, also, to uh, motivate our users that they actually also use the subscription for longer, the price or the discount on the price increases the longer the contract lasts. So we try to incentivize not just ourselves to make best use of our resources, but also to show the user that it is worth to use a phone for longer. Then, of course, another part of circularity on the next slide is also recycled materials. So um, integrating recycled materials or talking in general about materials and their environmental impact is very crucial for the circular economy. Um, and it is really a material choice where we can achieve most impact in doing this. Um, when we now look at, um, at a phone, it has more than 50 different materials integrated. So we have to focus on what do we address in our phones when we have to make these choices. And Fairphone has set up a fair material sourcing roadmap, which you can also find publicly on our homepage. And I think the link will also be put in the chat here. Uh, in which we determined which of the 14 materials that we use are the, or which 14 materials are the most important ones for us. And uh, we make there the difference between fair mined materials and recycled materials, because we see that uh, in the industry, it is often talked about recycled materials. However, we use for many materials more material than there is, then that can be recycled. So we will depend on mined materials for the decades to come. And therefore we cannot only look at recycled materials. Let's for example, look at gold. Gold is very uh, valuable. It's a precious metal. It is very well recycled. So specifically integrating recycled gold into a smartphone doesn't yield a very big impact because it will be used anyways. But gold has such a high demand that uh, in the future we will still be depending on gold because we cannot recycle as much gold as we need for our industry. And since large scale mining needs a lot of time to be set up, there are often small scale and artisanal miners involved in the production of this gold. And uh, mostly the approach that companies take is that they try to keep this material out of their supply chain. But what we cannot overlook is that there are hundreds of thousands of people that are really depending on having this as a livelihood, as a source of income. And this is uh, what we can see on the next slide. When Fairphone piloted together with the Alliance for Responsible Mining um, a credit system, to bring responsible supply of gold to the market. And this means that uh, mines can sell their gold to, uh, to the market for a normal market price. And the, like certified mines from the Alliance for Responsible Mining, and they get credits are generated from these sales that companies can then buy and the premium that the company buys goes directly to the mines. So usually it is very difficult to integrate materials um, that are fairly mined into products. However, with this crediting system, the money can go directly also to the, to the miners while a company can still make this claim. So the impact is more direct without losing a lot of money in trying to really track very complex supply chains down and trying to keep materials separately. And to conclude on the next slide, you can see that from a perspective of Fairphone, it is very important that we make informed choices, which are really on a, on a systemic level and also dr data driven, and that we need to keep materials in use for as long as possible in the first place. And on top of that, we also need to include people into the discussion around a circular economy, 
because we will need the mine materials in the future and only looking at recycled supply is not really showing the full picture of a circular economy but needs this mind input. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thea. Um, great stuff to get us started with. Thanks to everyone for um, that's started putting in questions. Thank you, Bev, for, for kicking that off. Um, remember, if there's a question there that you like the looks of and you'd like us to address, just click on the thumbs up and that will um, move it up to the top in our uh, in our view, and will help to ensure that we that we answer it. Um, without any further ado, let's move on and hear from Stuart. Thank you, and uh, welcome to all. Um, if you just go to my next slide, please. So I wanted to start. It was interesting that um, we finished with a picture of the circular economy. Uh, I'm going to start with a picture of the circular economy, one that we introduced at 2017 to the company to start thinking about all waste streams. Um, obviously, uh, you start from the centre and move out. So the greener it is, the better it is. Um, the grey area is the worst. Um, and we look at all the materials, including electronics, in the same way. So where can we assist in that process? And for the waste and resource sector, we are the evidence providers of failure. If the systems failed to get electronics back, if the people have failed to put them in the right place, to if they're broken too early, then generally they appear in our system at some point. And where they appear is also a representation of failure. So if you can imagine, if you put electronics um, in your bin and they were tipped in the back of a lorry, by the time they arrive anywhere, they're likely to be more broken than they were when you put them in the bin. Um, but if you put them in a controlled environment where they can be collected or you return them um, to a store or you put a different process in, then you can maintain the quality of them at the point and therefore the likelihood that they can be reused or repaired or components can be dismantled and reused in repairing other phones or other electronic systems is far greater. Now we see materials coming back in many different ways. If you can just hit the next return, please. So where do we normally see it? Well, we, where we would like to see it is in that reuse, repair and dismantle phase. So controlled return to us, maintaining the quality as best we can, allowing us the maximum opportunity for repairing them, uh, reusing them, um, be them sale and, and sell on, or be them for um, special good, uh, repairing them in terms of making them work again, using components from other devices or from the manufacturer if they can be purchased, and then if we can't do anything with the actual components, uh, to dismantle it and then make a store of uh, return items. Where we don't want them to see, next slide please, is where we see them in the wrong place. So you may look at that and say, well, surely you can see them in the recycling phase. Well, actually, when they come to us in the recycling phase, they generally mix with other materials. They've generally been broken, um, possibly contaminated with other materials that are running around in the waste stream. So actually the preference is for them, unless there's a designated curbside collection system um, for uh, we, uh, waste electronics, for them not to be in the recycling stream. In fact, we're getting increasing numbers of fires and uh, risks to our staff at the recycling plants from lithium ion batteries that are broken and go off. Uh, we had a large recycling plant in Scotland that completely burned down despite fire control and fire suppression um, from a battery that had broken in a bin. Um, in terms of reformation and recovery and disposal, then we're wasting the resource, we're wasting the potential of that resource to be added back in the system. So it's exactly where we don't want them. So next slide, please. And if I just look at this, um, if I go right to left. So on the right are all of the items that have gone through one of our energy from waste plants. And as you can imagine, most of these shouldn't be there in the first place. Um, they've been put in the wrong bin by the consumer or the business. They've gone through the process, completely unusable. Um, some of the metals we can recover, the precious metals are more difficult, but more the base metals we can get, um, but completely wasted asset. We don't want electronics in the residual waste going to our energy from waste plants. Um, if you then look at um, the middle picture with the skip, and materials stopped outside, Obviously, those materials in the open, they've been damaged when they've been put in the skip or put by the skip, they're left exposed, likely to rust, 
more difficult, therefore, to get to a status where we can repair them and resell them or get them back into the system as usable. Um, so again, uh, even though the person may have the right intentions, in that environment, they're likely to come back to us corroded, damaged, or more damaged than they need to be, and therefore less likely to be repaired, less likely to be able to put back in the system. And on the left is a picture of a bin at one of our recycling plants. And this is all the materials that consumers put in their recycling bins that they hope in wish recycling we can do something with. Each one of these causes problems at the plant. We have to pick it out. Uh, we then have to separate it uh, and put it back in the system to send elsewhere. Uh, and each one that has a battery in it um, poses a risk of fire or injury to our staff. So none of these are routes that we like to see the material. Next slide, please. However, um, where we can see the good materials in terms of um, the materials brought back to us, uh, HWLCs or CA sites, or for those of a, of a certain vintage, the tip. Um, often now we'll have people to intervene when you come on site. We'll help you find the right location for all the materials you're bringing back. Often that's the electronics. So the top left-hand graph is for one HWLC contract. So that's one local authority contract how many electronic items are passing back through our system. You can see that when people didn't have access to that due to the COVID closures um, under the label that, that says such, um, how, how much a reduction of those materials we were getting into our system through that controlled environment. Now, when those materials come in, we check them, we can validate them. Some of those sites can do their own pat testings and repairs. Other ones will send on to a location where they can be tested and repaired or cannibalized and reused to repair other items. If you then look at the, the value we get from those, so these are items that people have decided they won't put back into the e-sale system, that they won't give to charity, that they won't um, sell themselves and that they don't want to store anymore. So we're generally looking at the lower end materials, but we can still um, recover value from them. So that's the average value per item that we've received from 2018 to 2022. And that helps pay for those people to repair it and um, to get it back into the system working and get um, secondhand uh, pre-used items back into circulation for those that can't afford to buy new. So that's a great social value. In the middle is our hub in Manchester, the first of its kind in the UK and hopefully one of many. Um, that uh, is where we bring all of our um, HWRC materials that people bring to us for reuse and repair. Uh, into one location, we assess it for what we can do with it. And then we've got uh, individual pods where we can repair electronics, uh, upholstery, metals, um, we can upscale and we've also got a bike uh, repair location there as well. So we have specialist staff with specialized equipment that can go through and repair uh, certain items. I was there a few weeks ago and they had those lovely um, uh, lava lamps that uh, some of us remember from our uh, youth running around trying to repair those. Um, and they go off and they're sold as vintage and often uh, can return a reasonable return for us to continue to pay for those services. So very much a focus on getting those items back into the system as quickly as we can. Some of the key actions that we see going forward that can help, um, intervening at the curbside, so small wee collections, government's proposing in England that we start to collect small wee items. That's generally a size that fits within a uh, carrier bag from the supermarket to be collected at curbside um, and be brought back in a controlled environment. Intervene at our HWCs to maintain the quality of the goods received. Focused repair and dismantling, so making sure that we know what they are, we've got access to either our own um, repair parts or uh, a number of manufacturers will sell us the spare parts to get their items back and running. Capture the reasons for failure um, to feedback to manufacturers for design. We see the outcome of failure. We see why the Hoover doesn't work. We see why the washing machine is broken. And that insight should go back into design and that should be a continual discussion. And we're starting to have those discussions with the value chain uh, as they seek to understand what's going on with their product and how they can make it better. And obviously once we've done the repair and we've done the work, we need to provide a warranty. We need some certainty for people that we sell these items to that they can take it away and it has a warranty if it stops working within a period of time. So key one in confidence to sell on. So what do we do as a sector? We see the causes of failure and we're one route uh, to success of getting these items back into circulation or getting the uh, components back to repair other items or ultimately to get the materials back from the, the 
electrical items and back into a recycling environment. But you have to do that from the curbside, from the point of disposal or from, from discarding by the consumer of the business all the way through. You can't do it at our end only. Thank you. Thanks, Stuart. I have to ask a follow-up because um, isn't most of the e-waste going in the bin because it's already broken? So are we saying there's broken and then there's really broken? Or is there a big component of people that are just tired of that iPhone 5 and are chucking it in the bin and it actually could be of value to somebody um, if it weren't more smashed up. So I'm thinking of, you know, from your slide, it looked like a, a washer. So presumably it doesn't work anymore. Or uh, have I got that wrong? And is there actually a fairly big component of the stuff that gets into your waste streams that actually could work? So so um, a smaller item, no doubt, will come back because they're being replaced with a newer, better fancier, sexier looking system. Um, uh, we've, we've just redone our kitchen and the fridge that was in there before didn't fit with the new kitchen. So we sold that um, and the, in Freegal to another party who would fit it in their place. And so some of those items come back, but generally I think those that are still working, people perceive they still have a value. And that, that um, access to e-sales is a route that you increasingly see people saying, okay, if I perceive it as a value, so what we see coming our way is the material where people perceive it has no value. Um, it's it's a say the washing machine is broken and the cost of repair is more than the cost of a new one or is approaching the cost of a new one. And the people perceive that the value when you repair doesn't exist. Well, we can then take that uh, and maybe we can take a spare part from another similar machine that broke for a different reason and take one spare part and put it in. And we fixed it, we don't have to buy the spare part and that's back in circulation and we don't have to pay the repair cost. Because we do it at a centralized location, uh, we don't necessarily have the on cost or the uh, fixed cost that a uh, fixed repairer would have uh, in that journey. So we see uh, different routes. I think, I think the perception of value is a really key one for behavior change. Um, and often we get surprised at the HWRCs when people bring it in because we see value in things that they've, they see no value in. Um, and when you when you describe them and they can see that item come back and they can see it can be reused, then their perception of value changes. Um, and then maybe when they come back, they'll ask the question, could you do something with this? Um, and, and it's that it's that behavior change and that value appreciation, I think, that is probably the, one of the key things to making this thing work better. Okay, thanks, Stuart. And I, I'm, I'm confident that we're going to make our way back to this because I, I think it's some really interesting questions around where the responsibilities lie and and the infrastructure we're going to need to make this kind of activity economically viable but before we do that um thanks again to everybody for keeping those questions coming in already lots so let me emphasize again uh how much we value you getting in there and giving a thumbs up to the questions that you want us to focus our attention on once the Q&A starts. Um, and I'm kicking myself since the beginning that I, I, I made a note and then I overlooked it. Just a big uh, happy International Women's Day uh, to everybody out there um, today. And again, thanks for joining us. Okay, without any further uh, delay then, let's move on to Camille and we'll carry on with the program. Thank you. Hello, uh, thank you Rami for this invitation. <clears throat> it's always uh, very interesting uh, for me to talk about circular tech and, and even more when you have uh, so much uh, representative of our ecosystem around the table. Uh, so I'm Camille from Back Market. Uh, I don't know if all of you know this company. We are, can I have the next slide please? We are the leading marketplace for renewed tech or refurbished tech. Uh, we are only dedicated to sell refurbished electronic, electronic products and appliances. We are a French company, uh, but we are present in uh, 16 countries. We have been funded in uh, 2014. Uh, we work with more than uh, uh, 1,500 uh, refurb refurbishers and sellers. We have 
It's in the beginning more than 1 million customers. So the idea behind bike market, just to give you a, a rough idea of where, where from where is uh, the idea of, of this company, is it has started uh, from the a double observation. On one hand, and, and uh, Stuart and, and Tia uh, uh, have already mentioned it, um, we have a big problem uh, with the uh, pollution coming from electronics products and the manufacturing of electronics. Actually, it was very interesting to see your, your number here yeah, because uh, according to a lot of studies I have read, the manufacturing of electronic products represent more than between 50 and 75% of the impact of digital on the planet. So it's a big topic uh, to address. Uh, so there was this observation, the damage of the manufacturing of new electronic products on the planet. And on the other end, the problem is the existence of uh, very old solutions, which is repair. But the problematic with the repair market and the refurbished market was its uh, heterogene, heterogeneous aspect, meaning that it was very difficult for the customer to uh, actually trust repair and refurbisher in the purchasing of devices that can have that have actually a price that's not they are not cheap cheap uh, devices so the idea was to find solutions to massify the consumption of refurbished product or renewed product by building a trust between um, uh, the customer and the refurbishing market so uh, the impact of, uh, of the company I started to show results uh, over the, the years because uh, we we had uh, the, the preoccupation to actually find robust data to calculate the true impact of tech and the impact of refurbishment. Uh, since uh, our creation in 2014, back market has contributed to avoid more than 1 million tons of CO2. So it's actually uh, a very, uh, a very significant result. And that's why uh, that's that's because actually every time you a uh, customer chose a refurbished product over a new one, it actually avoids seventy seven kilograms of CO two, and you can apply this kind of uh, of numbers to every kind of uh, every category of refurbished device you can find on the platform. Bike market has been committed <clears throat> to its mission uh, since the beginning. Uh, we have become last year a mission-driven company, meaning that we have integrated in our article of associations the fact that we are fighting to actually reduce this impact of tech on the planet. Uh, and we have uh, implemented what we have called the buyback program, which actually incentive uh, customers to resell their device to refurbishers to actually give them a second, a second uh, uh, life and avoid the generation of e-waste. So the idea of back market was really to massify this refurbishment industry to ease the access to those kind of devices uh, to the end customer by building by this trust uh, toward this market. Can I have a second slide, please? Uh, this is our model. So uh, it's basically what I was, uh, was uh, explaining. We, have, we are a marketplace. We allow uh, customers to find the uh, best choice in electronic uh, and apply, uh, devices and appliances on the refurbished market. We have set high quality standards to make sure that this, this trust is actually growing uh, from the customer side. We help uh, the sellers to improve their services uh, all along the year. And we offer the, the customer to resell their own device to the sellers that are selling on the platform. So it's the idea is to close the loop on the tech, uh, on the tech market uh, for the end customer. Can I have the next slide, please? And the big challenge around refurbished tech was actually to, how, to ask ourselves how we can change the consumption habits. For a very long time, the second-hand electronic uh, devices, the second-hand tech, as a kind of a, a, a bad image, it was like related to cheapness. Uh, so our goal at back market was actually to change this and to make sure that refurbished and renewed products are a true solution 
for every uh, need in regarding tech and appliances for the customer. So first, the idea was to build the same kind of purchasing experience. If we want customer to actually change their consumption habits, if we want the consumer to start trusting the second-hand market, we have to set high quality standards. Our motto uh, internal, uh, internally at back market is there is no more factual reason to buy new. So we have to give the customers the same kind of, uh, of experience that buying refurbished tech than buying new. So we give choices, we give uh, warranties, we give insurance, we give premium customer care, etc. So that's the first part. That actually is the foundation of how you can actually start to convince uh, consumers to change their habits when it comes to tech. Then there is a message. Uh, at Bank Market, we have a focus uh, on, let's say, play on the same landfill that the big tech uh, constructors, meaning the marketing, the marketing part. We are convinced that the consumption habit were able to change a bit if we are able to change the image of uh, reuse tech, of second-hand tech. So we have invested a lot in a marketing campaign with a particular tone of voice. Uh, we, are, we are trying really to make uh, refurbished tech sexy for the customer and to make them uh, uh, a reason to be, pr to be proud of their purchase. Like we are trying to inform the more we can the customer on the impact of tech, on the impact of refurbishment, so they can understand that what they are doing when they change their purchasing habits, when they are trying to go the circular, they actually have a concrete impact uh, on the environment by changing their, their consumption habits. So we are trying to, to build a joyful revolutions around around uh, refurbished tech, around, around second-hand tech, to make sure that it's not uh, anymore uh, a reason to be ashamed to not buy new. It can, it can seem a bit simple, but actually we have, uh, we have noticed that it have, has a great impact uh, on the, the way the, the customer reacts uh, to, uh, to second-hand. The, the, we, we, have, we have noted that uh, the, the reputation of refurbished tech, especially in France, when we are, it's our more mature country now, but uh, uh, the, the vision of people of refurbished tech has changed a lot. And it's starting to change as well uh, in other countries uh, where we are operating, like the UK, like the US, Spain, etc. For instance, we have noticed in the past year that the part of people that are coming uh, to back market to buy refurbished tech because they want to have a better impact has increased a lot. Uh, it has passed for, in the UK and the US, it has passed from 5% two years ago to 25% uh, uh, today. So we are seeing this change of consumption habits uh, growing slowly among uh, our customers. And then, but uh, last but not least, something that is it, very important is to be reliable. That you cannot, as a company, position uh, so strongly on environmental impact if you are not trying your best to have the more positive impact we can. So part of my job is also to make sure that we are adopting the best practice uh, internally. Uh, we, have, we, are, we are building a carbon, a carbon uh, reduction uh, trajectory based on the Paris Agreement. We are, as I was mentioning at the beginning, a mission-driven company uh, since last year. We uh, finance study, independent study, to uh, make sure that we have robust data. So for instance, we have support uh, and contribute to the first life cycle analysis on refurbished uh, devices, tech devices, sorry. Uh, last year uh, by the French Agency for Environment, ZADIM. And we are also working uh, on uh, with a lot of uh, NGOs and associations to promote circularity at a European level, at a French level, etc. So the idea of positioning strongly and trying to push the, the consumer to change their, their, their customer, uh, their consumption habits, sorry, has to go with the adoption of, or trying at least to be exemplary in terms of practices for, for the company. And I think it's something that is very important when you are trying to change, to change uh, uh, habits. Maybe we can, I, I just put you some example of, uh, the marketing campaign we have done, uh, this is in the UK. Uh, maybe you have, you have seen it, we were all over the metro station and the buses 
uh, last fall. So uh, you have the next one is in the US. So we were a bit everywhere. In the US, it was interesting because we have to change uh, our wording. We couldn't talk about refurbished because it's uh, doesn't it's not very underst uh, understood in the US. So we work on a tech rebound to explain that actually we were giving a second life to a technological device. And the last one, it's a campaign we have done uh, almost a year ago in the UK, uh, highlighting the impact you were uh, avoiding through the purchase of refurbished devices. We have, of course, a touch of humor, which is uh, our, our turn of voice uh, at back market. So uh, that's what we are trying to do. We actually uh, work with Fairphone. Fairphone are actually the only new devices we, we, we sell on the platform because we are sharing the same value and, and the, same, the same objective regarding uh, the reducing the impact of tech. And we share totally the idea of uh, improving the eco-conception of devices. And uh, it's, it's really important, I think, to work with the customer and with the consumer by giving them information to make them responsible of their purchases, but not try to make them feel guilty about uh, what they are doing. Like it's important for us to explain to a company, but not to judge or to, uh, or to point at, uh, at, uh, at customers that are not yet in this path. And that's it for me, thank you. Thank you, Camille. Could I just ask before we, we go on, how is this, I, I'm seeing some, we're, we're getting around a little bit around extended producer responsibility, seems to be a direction of some of the chat is going right now, but um, how, how do the, how do the big brands, do, do you have relationships with, I mean, you said you don't have other brands on the, um, on the platform. We, we, we have a lot of other brands, but the only new references we have are Fairphone. Fairphone has a dedicated uh, uh, shop, a shop, a shopping shop uh, in the platform. All the other devices we sell are famous brand, Apple, Samsung, Dell, whatever, but they are refurbished, meaning they are second-hand uh, devices. And we work with uh, ex refurbisher experts uh, mostly in Europe, a bit in the US, uh, a bit uh, in Asia, uh, that are actually experts in refurbishing and they collect themselves those, uh, those used uh, devices, give them a second life, give them the, the, the repair, uh, the repair the, they need and send them back on the platform. And what our job is to make sure that the devices that arrive on the platform actually respect the quality standard we have set to make sure, as I was saying, that this trust is actually growing from the, uh, the consumer side. And are they generally supportive, I guess, what I want to get at? I, I could see there being techno, you know, engineering uh, secrets that uh, they might share to make refurbishment more efficient, for example, or going the other way, as Stuart described how being able to provide feedback to the manufacturers about recurring problems to perhaps help them make their products better. Are those kind of dialogues happening? Yes, yes, yeah. of course. There, there is a, a, a big step to take from the customer side to ease the repairing and the recycling. And I totally uh, agree with that. Uh, mostly regarding the eco-conception of the product. But also, when you is come to repair, to the availability of spare parts. Today, it's not really convenient for uh, for big constructors to uh, to ease the repair because we are still in a in a scheme of uh, plan obsolescence. What what we are trying to actually fight, and uh, it's the same same kind of mission Fairphone has. Um, so we are working on this by talking with the constructors. Uh, when it's possible, trying to help them to develop their own uh, uh, refurbished uh, activity as well. And we are also working with the public authority to make them understand what are the complications that can uh, meet repairers, refurbishers in their day-to-day -day business when it comes to repair 
the, the smartphones and, or the, the laptops uh, per se, but also to access uh, um, spare part. We have uh, R&D lab at Back Market, it's based in, uh, in our office in Bordeaux in the south of France. Uh, this lab is actually dedicated to develop new techniques of repairs and new machines to repair and to test as well spare parts that are not branded by the, by the constructor, but can work very well with the, with the, uh, the devices. So there is still a big challenge here. We need to work with the big brand as well on this because it's depend to them a lot. But we are trying to do it like in, in good intelligence, working with them, working with the public authority to make sure that we can actually massify this access to a circular economy from the tech device. But this is true for, for a lot of, uh, of industry, I think. Okay, thank you, Camille. And now our final speaker, Carmen, over to you. You're muted, Carmen. Yeah. There we go. Can you hear me now? Hello? Yes, go ahead. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much and thank you for having me. Um, I think a lot of elements from um, my, the speakers before me, you will recognize in, in my presentation, I will try uh, more to speak uh, uh, about the differences. So if I can have the next shot, I can I can start telling you a little bit about Taste of IT, who we are, uh, how we came to existence and where we are today. So Taste of IT is a Finnish company. Uh, it has been set up uh, in 25 years ago. We just celebrated uh, our anniversary. And uh, it has been created in a period where uh, PCs were proliferating already. Uh, so you have, you start having all these uh, smart devices uh, that are proliferating. Um, they start to be on, on every table, on every desk. Um, and still nobody pays enough attention to them uh, in, in terms of how, how they are acquired, how they are used, but most importantly, what happens to them at the end of life, whatever that end of life might, might, might be. So the way the original idea, idea and the way this step idea was created was by asking the question, what really, and this 25 years ago, what really happens to the old computer and most importantly, what happens with the data uh, that is left on this old computer when they are no longer in use. Uh, so this was the base uh, and, and this is how it all started, right? So if we can move to the next, uh, and, and I can build a little bit uh, uh, on where we are today. We started in Finland. Um, we expanded in the Nordic countries. So we have operations in all the Nordic countries. And in 2019, we have signed a joint venture with BMP Paribas that was interested to uh, expand our services to their clients. Uh, and we are also interested to expand our services uh, in the rest of Europe, hence the color coding. Uh, the bubbles that you see are our refurbishing centers. So we have three refurbishing centers in Finland, Sweden, Norway, in the UK, in the joint venture. And we are about to open this year, uh, another one in uh, France. Now, if we can move to the next one, let me tell you what exactly, where, uh, what are the, the challenges that we addressed in Sri And by the way, we are only B2B. So there were a lot of discussions here about B2C and selling it to the customers and customers' behavior and trying to educate the customers into a new way uh, of using various assets. Um, we, we deal to companies, uh, we deal B2B. And believe me, there is a huge work also of education to move these companies from the traditional way of acquiring, using, and throwing away these devices into getting them to change their processes to be able to have a circular way, a different way 
of using technology. That is why we also, I, 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 I like to call ourselves as evangelists of the uh, uh, circular economy through the work that we're trying to do when we speak with, it, with big companies. So the challenges we address, because I think it is important to start uh, speaking about that and I explain the offering. Um, now, a lot of challenges companies have are at the acquisition uh, moment. Uh, so they, you know, there are big companies with uh, big numbers of employees. Um, think about the fact that today all of us have at least a mobile phone, uh, a, a tablet, and a ThinkPad. Some people still do have desktops uh, on their offices. So suddenly one person, one employee has uh, at least two devices, if not three. Uh, and these devices have to be acquired um, in a most efficient way uh, with the most efficient price. Uh, and, and they are also today, especially uh, in, in the last period where we had COVID and all uh, flexible working, they have been coming a key tool in the hands of the employees to be able to be productive. And here at the acquisition phase, there is also a discussion about total cost of ownership and how much money a company uh, and what is the best way for a company to acquire uh, the smart devices. And I'm referring here to smart devices only and to B2B. Uh, uh, and, and this is what we uh, address, and I, I will explain how. The second thing we are addressing is the electronic waste. Uh, and I'm glad that uh, uh, the speakers before me spoke about uh, a lot about repair, um, uh, because I think this is important. The way I look at electronic waste, and I know numbers have been uh, uh, said here, I try to put it in an image that I can understand because I'm not sure I, I always understand metric cubes, millions of metric cubes. Uh, but today, some, 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 a way of speaking about electronic waste is the fact that we, um, we, we waste about 14.4 Eiffel Towers a day or 1,000 laptops per second just to give a feeling of the magnitude of the electronic waste today. And a lot of people, when they speak about electronic waste, they speak a lot about recycling. They miss the reuse space. Uh, and, and I think and it was already mentioned here, the most important, of course, recycling and the way what you do and how you recover the metals is important. But before you get there, uh, I think there is a very important phase uh, of reuse uh, that that can save a lot of, of CO2. The last but not the least, and let me, uh, I think it's, it's a very opportune uh, moment to speak about the digital divide. Uh, and, and this is something very dear to my heart. And I'm also happy that I, give, I am given the opportunity to talk about this today because it is the woman day, women day. Um, and when I speak about digital divide, um, the way uh, because we are enabling and we are we are reselling and uh, used equipment, it gives people opportunities that are that don't need or they don't have the possibility uh, to to access to very expensive devices uh, to use uh, uh, these devices. So it's a it's a kind of a democratization of the of the technology, and there is no um, surprise that the U U United Nations Commission on the Status of Women is really centered on innovation and technology, uh, technological change, and on education in in uh, in the digital age. And I think specifically for women uh, and the statistics that I have been. Uh, seeing today with great, great sadness and regret because it looks like we are rather going backward than forward. Uh, but I think technology is a key element and the democratization of, of, of technology is a big way and a big weapon for us to, to really to achieve gender equality. But if I can move to the next chart, let me explain you very, very shortly our solution. Again, we are a services company. We call our, ourselves three step IT because our services come in three steps. The first step, the blue, is the acquisition. And this is where we help the customers with the procurement process. We help with the funding. 
because we 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 work with a lot of funders and we can arrange financing contracts or leasing contracts. Um, and here is the piece where we can improve financially the offer because we take risk on the residual values because we have our own refurbishing centers and because we know these assets uh, for 25 years, we are able to give uh, to take the risk on the residual values. And this obviously improves the financial, improves the economics uh, of the transaction. Um, so a lot of uh, financial benefits efficiency in terms of procurement in this stage. The second stage we call uh, manage the equipment during the lifetime. So imagine that you have mobile phones that are used for two, three years or PCs that are used for three, four years. And here in time, we have developed an in-house uh, software application where basically we do everything for the customers. We, we manage all the devices and, and that's quite uh, important in, from the point of view of operations because imagine that you have everybody working in the car, at home, um, all these smart devices with data spread uh, everywhere. And, and so we developed this uh, software application uh, where we can run various reports, operational reports, financial reports. Uh, we put control in the hand of the customers. They know exactly who is uh, using uh, which, dev uh, which device. Um, and as you have been probably know, there are a lot of horrendous stories where, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of such devices have been lost and the companies can't find them anymore. Uh, and using this uh, application that we have, uh, they know exactly um, what they have and where they are. And we also have elements of health check of the devices uh, where we could check and control if a computer has full of blue screens, if something needs to do to be done about this, and we can um, we can uh, offer we can signal in time that repairs could be in time that prolong the life. And here I come at the last step. The last step is about refresh renewal, um, and then we make this very easy for the customer. So we we have notification, we send out. Notification, we said, you know, the life, the first, the primary lifetime is about to end, what you want to do, you want to extend, you want to return. And then we organize the return. We take the equipment back in our refurbishing centers. Um, we erase the data. We use Blanco, another Finnish company that is uh, for the time the best um, in, in, uh, in the kind on, on erasing safely the data. That is very important, specifically with the cyber security discussions that are uh, today, and especially for our clients, because we work a lot with governments, with banks, uh, with sensitive parts uh, of, of defense. Uh, so it is of utmost importance that they have a reliable partner where they know that if they give back the equipment, they take care safely uh, of their data. And then we have a team that's reselling. Uh, the equipment that has been uh, refurbished. And coming back to my comment about the importance of using or giving a second life to an asset, we resell and give a second life of 98% of the equipment that comes back um, from, um, from a lease. So this is what we do. The last page I want to show you, because I think it's very, very important in, in the context of, of today, uh, there are a lot of refurbishing centers, a lot of small companies that are doing that. I think in the context of cybersecurity, in the context of ESG, people start to be very careful uh, to understand with whom they are working um, in terms of, of various social um, uh, things that are important in terms of ethics, in terms of how these services are provided, but, uh, the la but not in the least in terms of are their data secure? And you may have seen also, I think in the US, JP Morgan paid uh, a huge fine of 35 million or so because they um, disposed out of some assets. Information was not correctly uh, uh, deleted and it ended up in the wrong hands. These are photos from one of our center. 
Uh, and I'm not going to go through them, but it shows you exactly all the stages uh, uh, from the moment the equipment is returned um, and the customers uh, get the report where they know exactly what is the status, where is the equipment, information has been deleted, has been inspected. And we also give the customers reports saying out of these 100 uh, pieces that you have returned, we graded them, we refurbished them, we have been able to um, resell, let's say, 85, thank you very much. Through the, the way you are consuming technology, you give the possibility uh, to avoid CO2 because you avoid creation uh, of new equipment uh, and also the possibility for the ones that don't have the means still to use technology. So. This is uh, where I stop, uh, and I hope uh, that this gives you a view of what we are doing, um, and I hope there will be an interesting conversation and dialogue now. Thank you, Carmen. Okay, we're going to turn off the slides now, um, and Camille, I'll ask you to turn your camera back on, and I would just ask everybody, we've got We've got almost 250 people on the call, but still only um, 20 votes for our top question. We've got about 20 minutes for Q&A. We're not going to get through all of these questions. So please uh, do get in there and, and scan through the questions and just give a quick thumbs up to the ones you'd like us to, to focus our time on in the time we have left. But we're going to start with uh, Sylvia's question because it has pulled in the most votes now and I think it is a good general question that's going to cover a lot of big issues. Sylvia asks, how do you drive behavior change to help users adopt circular economy? And um, you know, so many facets to this. I've already asked about, uh, you know, th there was a question, um, Stuart, you, you gave a written answer to around extended producer responsibility. And I think there's clearly a role for government in in helping to create recycling infrastructure um and then of course how much of it are we going to put on individuals and consumers to to be more circular so i, I think i don't um, yeah you go ahead and start Stuart, and then others can pile in I, th I think the answer the answer is probably many answers i don't think there's one answer that works for everybody um, everyone's situation is different, so we need to come up with a number of options. Where, if you take the Fairphone example, where they they're, they're looking at servitization in a, in a fair way. Uh, I use the word uh, rental servitude uh, in one of my written answers, um, where you have to be careful that you don't restrict choice by making rental your only choice um, uh, in that process. It has to be the right choice for the consumer at that time um, that they need. Um, I think there's multiple routes that we industry needs to provide that's producers, retailers, et cetera, and allow the public to, uh, and business to access the ones that are most convenient and work with their own business need um, uh, to, to kind of deliver their outcomes. So if you want to buy, then provide a repair and, um, maintenance service if you want to rent then build that into the process um, so that you don't go through the process of restricting choice which forces people down either spending too much money or going down the wrong route so i think the more choices we give them the more they'll choose and the more choices we give them that are the more circular ones then the more circular they'll become and they'll become circular on that basis and i think the other point i would make is um, you need more uh, very public. Um, if I look at the repair shop, for example, for, for us in our sector for non-electronics, I know, but, but when people see that, that granny's old chair has been made into something that's worth £600, you change people's perceptions of worth and value. And I think it's important that we help people understand the value that, 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 that the things that they are looking to discard have to either recover themselves in terms of I think everything in our kitchen that we, we took away that was workable um, was sold on to other people um, in that journey. 
it's that perception that it's worth it. Some, somebody will find value for it, even if it's the component parts. Um, and I think that that stops the discarding of my first choice and discarding becomes my last choice. Um, I'll find a route to find a home for it. And then you need access to platforms and markets where you can put it on a system that are safe and secure and you feel that they can work for you. So I think as many options as possible and as convenient as possible, and people will go circular without even knowing it. If I may, if I may join here, you, uh, Stuart. So what I see in the in the enterprise world, in in the business world, I think in 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 a way, consumers are maybe a little bit more advanced than the companies. Uh, so you and and what I also see though um, is that companies at one point in time would need to follow the consumer uh, behavior and attitude. Not in the least because there there are because of activism, because of people pushing them, because of people appreciating certain companies more than the others based on how they behave and how they they do things. But what I have seen so far is that if I go and, and, and pitch to a customer and I try to educate and say, you know, there's a different way of consuming technology. The, the acquisition motivation today is still financial. It's either uh, it's better price for me or it's operational, more effective. Yes, cybersecurity is very important. And then the last in the queue comes the sustainability discussion, right? Uh, and you can see this today mainly on the big corporations that, that uh, start to have ESG policies and so on and so forth. So therefore, I believe that for the time being, what I see is that still the financial impact is the underlying uh, motive and reason why the companies invest into a circular uh, acquisition rather than a linear one. Nevertheless, I believe that what happens and what I see, and by the way, in France, because I'm in Paris today, there are new regulations coming, and I think these regulations will help. So, for example, in France, public uh, enterprises, in the tenders, they will have to acquire 25% of the equipment to be used. Equipment, not new equipment. Uh, there will also be, there are new regulations, I understand, coming from the European Union in the next 18 to 24 months uh, that will... Uh, describe exactly how you measure as a company your environmental impact and how exactly you have to report. Because right now there is a lot of in, in confusion as to what should be the right KPIs, how they should they be reported. So there is not a common standard that can uh, help. And when this, you know, you, you say you can't, you can't, you can't manage what you don't measure, right? So when all these measurements will be in place, it's not going to be only a nice to have, but it's going to be you have to have. Uh, so I think, honestly speaking, this would help a lot and push a lot the companies to adopt new circular ways of consuming technology. But here is where they will need help because to change in a company, the process that you have for 20 years in a way of acquisition and consuming to a different way, it requires a lot of companies and a lot of us uh, to support them uh, in this change and in this transition. If I, if I may very quickly on this, because it's our very purpose to convince people to change their consumption habit and to go circular, I think I mean, I'm really agree with you, Carmen, on the price driver. <clears throat> the fact that you, uh, circular products are often uh, cheaper. It's a really good argument. And as I was saying, at Black Market, we have 75% of our customers that are coming because of prices. We have to face it. But the idea is once they are here, to give them the information about their purchase, to give them the information mm -hmm. about impact. And I, I'm repeating myself a lot, but I think the key element is trust. And this trust has to be built through the change of practices from the company through information, through quality standards and a regulation on the circular market as well, to make sure that all the conditions are, are, are gathered to offer uh, the, the condition of, uh, of the trust for, for the customer. We, it's 
because there are, are smart people, like they actually made their own choice. We have to, to have faith in the fact that when they have the information, when they have the access, when they when they understand what it is about and 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 what what there is actually behind the the practices and, and the the manufacturing processes, they will uh, make the good choices. I I totally believe that. Stuart, you spoke a lot. Oh, sorry, Thea. If, uh, I'm just gonna interject briefly, and then maybe you comment on what I say. Because Stuart, you spoke a lot about value, and and that there is still a lot of value in goods that are being discarded or that are that still have life in them even if not necessarily to the person that bought them originally when they were new but clearly there are some pretty hefty transaction costs in realizing that value and in some areas clearly again in smartphones there's enough value that it overcomes the transaction costs and still allows you to sell a a refurbished phone for less than a new phone and 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 we have success and and other it that that works as well um is that part of the challenge though and i, I was suspecting it is is we need to work on those transaction costs of extracting that value from these used goods more efficiently whether that's cleaning up the collection side or the refurbishment or or so on maybe just a comment and and thea you uh, welcome to comment on that or, or carry on where you were going before. Okay, I'll, I'll just answer to your question first. I, I think um, value value is perception. So so depending on where you sit in the in the earnings queue, uh, etc., value has a different thing. For different parts of of this country or other countries, and you see value perceptions very differently. Um, in terms of the value exchange. If we can help designers and producers design things that are really easy and cheap to do uh, in terms of repair. So for example, some TVs, you've got four screws and they're all the same screw head. Other TVs, you've got 17 screws and four different screw heads. So one costs a lot more than the other to, to access and repair, never mind the spare parts. So there's lots of things we can do to, to reduce the wasted effort and the wasted cost that goes into repair. At that point, you then increase the intrinsic value of the item because you still have to spend less time repairing it effectively, and therefore there's less invested cost um, to get it back into the system. Uh, I think I, I also come back to the point I did make in the presentation is um, we often see goods that have been put out for repair that have come back by the wrong route and therefore come back more damaged than they were when they were put out. Um, so we have to kind of, would you put your phone in a, um, a steel box and post it with no padding and hope that it got to the user at the other end unbroken through the postal system. No, you wouldn't you put padding around it. Um, so all the routes that come back need some some certainty that, that the item comes back in the same state of discard because that, that also raises the highest potential for delivering that back in the process. And I think finally um, uh, is we have to price in the, the externalities that we don't necessarily price in today so that new truly costs the resource cost of new and secondhand or reused reflects its value in not having to buy new and, and gain new materials to put into it. Uh, and that's really a political um, construct uh, to make sure that uh, reuse is properly accounted for and new is properly accounted for on a worldly resource and carbon basis rather than um, with a with an unfair externality price, which means that new can be cheaper because we're not fully paying for its burden. Thanks, Stuart. Tia, whatever you wanted to say before, please feel free to say it. And then let's also, you carry on and, and let's deal with our second question from Tom that's just directed at you and asking about any barriers you're facing um, in sourcing recycled materials and, and how you see that changing going forward. Yes, so add to, the, to add to the last question also about the value of a phone, I think it is very important also as a manufacturer to just acknowledge and show to the new customer that every new product also means an ending of an old product, or at least for most, this is the case. 
And what we also do at Fairphone there is that we are already in the new packaging of the new phone that is arriving, but we tell our, our users that this packaging can be used to hand in the phone for recycling or for reuse. And then, of course, still a lot of people don't do it because they have certain barriers. So we need to address these barriers that they encounter, like, for example, not knowing what happens to the data if the phone broke and they were not able to save the data anymore. And I think this is really important then to address it and really create this awareness what exactly happens to the phone and make this really um, so that it is not a lot of effort for the user to find out these things but really with the start of the new product, already addressing that there is an old product which where you can keep the value high when you really make the, the right choices. Um, then also to the barriers for the recycled materials, um, it depends really on the materials, what barriers you have. So for example, there is a big difference between recycled materials or if you, talk about metals or if you're talking about plastics also. Um, sometimes it is it is also or it is often also related to the value of the of the material. So for example, talking about gold, like in the presentation, gold is recycled because the value is very high, but there are other materials that are basically not or not very well recycled, also because they are basically too cheap as a primary material that it would make sense to recycle them from an economic perspective. Um, in, in the design itself, um, stru the structure of the material can be a problem. So if you use it for uh, materials which the user really holds in their hands, you can potentially feel that there are unevenness or you can also see it depending on the on the finishing on the outside that there are maybe some some what you would say is an error in a, new, in, in a new material, in a newly produced product. So you have to work also with the design basically to cover that up. Um, also, of course, the development time. So if you think of recycled plastics, if you have to, if you have to, you have to test way more, if you have to first find the ways to integrate these materials in a way that it fulfills the specifications that you need for the products for the for the safety tests. So it can, for example, become more brittle. Um, so you need more time, you need to pay for extra costs. And also you have a higher risk for pro problems with the product afterwards, because the product usually they have not been tested like or tested in practice, depending on what the user does with it, you are basically running the risk that you might have higher return rates if you integrate recycled plastics. And you were also asking, or there was also a question if we think that this is going to change in the future. Um, I think depending on the pricing of the primary materials, um, if the demand increases, it becomes also more uh, interesting to recycle other materials. But until these recycling processes are set up, it takes a lot of time, of course. And at the same time, also legislation, which, uh, for example, the ba battery directive is also prescribing a minimum percentage of recycled materials and batteries. So that also then um, well, makes it possible for recyclers to rely on that they will have customers in the future so that these recycling capacities are also really generated. So then we also have the supply, which will be more easily available in the future. So, well, I hope that it will become easier to integrate recycled materials in the future, yes. No, that's a great point. We often hear in the previous sessions, um, we, we sometimes hear about there not being enough recycled material available. And I think that's an important point that some confidence that the markets will be there for those materials are going to be necessary to create the, the infrastructure to process them and bring them to market. Uh, we really don't have any uh, time left. I wanted to come back to the question from uh, Shijo um, about extended producer responsibility, but I think all we can do is give you each about 30 seconds um, just to give a closing remark. And if there's anything that you had hoped you were gonna get to say during today's session and you didn't get to, 
this is your chance. But we have to be very brief because I still have to put a slide up um, with some upcoming events. So how about we just go back through in the order in which we we started? So um, Tia, any final words from you? Anything you didn't get to say that you were hoping you would? I think I can just stress again that uh, prolonging lifespan is really the most important talking point that we should also have, not just recycling, but really prolonging the lifespan, giving products a second life, returning them as soon as possible to keep their value at the highest point that they can be reused because recycling, material recycling never yields 100%. So we lose a lot of materials. So we really need to think about the first life of a material because before we talk about recycled materials in our products. Great, thank you, Thea, great point. Stuart. Uh, two points for me. Uh, one is there is a huge amount of activity going on. Uh, I, I truly believe that at some point it will emerge and, con and consolidate together and the market will have changed um, and those those laggard producers that are sitting in the linear system will then realize they're having a Nokia or a Kodak moment. Um, I think the second one is um, you can't do anything unless you measure it. Uh, and I, I think where we are lacking perhaps is a comprehensive system of data collation and management so that we understand what, where, how, um, what the repairs were um, and that process, because that can feed back into the value chain to improve things. Thanks, Stuart. Camille. I, I have said a lot of things, so I don't want to, to be so long on this, but uh, just maybe to reloop on what we have said. This is a, this is not uh, uh, the business of, of just one company or four companies. That's really like a collective effort we, we have to put in place. Public authority have a big play, big role to, to play on this, uh, to ease the access to the circular economy, to the customer and to the circular businesses to the market and uh, there is very very inspirational stuff that have been done today we are on a good way but uh, we have to see it see it and as a, as a collective effort thanks camille and carmen last but not least yeah thank you i think i think uh, we have a lot of smart people that will invent and define new products new materials uh, new technological processes so i'm less worried about that uh, I just do hope that sessions like this because, uh, will help move behavior, uh, consumer behavior, companies' behaviors, government behaviors. And for me, this is the, the most difficult work to be done uh, because I think changes perspective and changing ways of doing things uh, is a difficult thing. That's why I'm grateful for everybody that is organizing such awareness sessions that help everybody advocate and hopefully uh, getting on the right um, track. Thanks, Carmen. Thanks, Camille. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks, Tia. It's been a real pleasure speaking with you um, this afternoon. Rob, can I get that slide up there? Um, as I said at the outset, um, this is part of a series that we're running. Um, the next session in the series, we're going to be looking at packaging. That's going to be on the 22nd of March at the same time of day as today. Um, the session is going to showcase best practice case studies demonstrating practical action on eliminating problematic and unnecessary packaging, improving design of packaging to minimize overall material inputs and increase recycled content, encouraging the adoption of reuse models, et cetera, et cetera. We have great guests again. Um, we'll have uh, people coming from DS Smith, Reckitt, and RAP. Um, the link is in the chat for you to register for that session. Just because you are with us today, you're not automatically registered for that session. So please do um, click through and sign up. I'm sure it's going to be another fantastic session. Thank you all so much for joining, for being so engaged with all of your questions and your activity in the chat. Um, I really enjoyed today's session and thank you so much for coming along. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.